Can we take our seats and we'll start the round table? I feel carrying this, this around because I'm one of those people who like to talk waving my hands at pictures. Like I'm trying to be Mel Torme and I, that's not going to happen. But I, uh, we, we will, we can improvise a little bit. We, you do have between six and eight minutes to uh, give your initial straight up impressions. And we'll try to get as much conversation in after that as we can, because the round table we're designed to, we, we want to include a larger proportion of question, answer, conversation and talk. So I'll try and be the MC for that after we've each had a chance to talk ourselves. I just want to offer some provocations or, or things to begin all of this. I'm sure in whatever field you are, you could find by substituting a couple of words, your own version for this quote. It, except for a very few people in our field, in arts and humanities, that is something like the reason we got into what we do. It's just that you have to put your, your the right words in for it. Uh, unless you're uh, unless you're actually Alexander. Uh, anybody else do, does novels in here? Okay, so that fits. I think it still holds. So I want to just suggest, I'm trying to be provocative. So I, even some of the things I'm pushing today, I'll push with a grain of salt. But I, we, we have this topic every Christmas and every year. It's a little bit like, you know, how far will, the, will civilization collapse before we talk about this next Christmas? Um, and I'm sure all of you thought of it that a little bit. I want to just give a few modest, ironic, um, dry proposals on... on ways in which we might actually find ourselves in a position of strength if we could swallow or adapt to things that we find threatening. So very quickly, I, you know all of this, COVID and the liberating arts. We were being attacked, all of, as all of you know, pretty heavily long before COVID came around. Um, we were already being described by all of the promoters and, and uh, money people at colleges and universities as a recruitment poison, and as problematic assets in the job market, meaning that even if your graduates get jobs, they're the wrong kinds of jobs and you're the wrong kinds of graduates. They're not gonna pay back their student loans, they're not the kinds of people we wanna produce. It won't happen fast enough. That we were constantly being told to defend ourselves by a brand new breed of administrators who looked at our arts and humanities with an eyebrow cocked and a, and a dust pan and a whisk broom ready to sweep them away if we didn't reprioritize them into making sense every single year. And if you had any kind of admin in your department, you did three times as much prioritizing work as you did teaching all of a sudden. The <clears throat> communities of origin for our students seem to experience more and more disconnect between the way the students were raised in their cultures and appreciating the arts that they enjoyed and what the parents thought they were being were good at when they were in junior high and high school. And what they got with those students when we sent them back from higher education. If they came back and then, I'm just repeating what everybody knows here. During COVID, tuition paying parents of students from upper middle schools to universities and the arts and humanities had a chance to see what the curriculums and the teachers were like live online while their students did it and suddenly there was a rebellion. Our response has been to, to dig in, trying to see what, do I aim at the laptop? While well, Costas figures out why it's non-responsive. Oh. I had mentioned turn it off. That's true. A STEM person would have known that. <laughs> no. A STEM person would have, would have taken this, rebuilt it with 12 new features, and it wouldn't have worked. It's fun to be able to just display prejudice at the right time as long as you can take it. Some of the effects of code, I'm just throwing some un unusual ones out, but were unexpected. According to the Atlantic Monthly in Europe and the United States, for the last two years, paper books have been outselling ebooks. Weird as it sounds, 
actual physical media has been outselling e-media for music. And that sounds impossible, but you have to remember that an awful lot of people now don't buy any e-music. They just sign up for streaming services and have access to it temporarily. But vinyl has been outselling the other physical media, and I find that really strange. Now, that can't last forever, I suspect, although it's the reason that some of the music stores have changed. But it's an example of the fact that history swerves all the time. It goes in directions that you don't expect after you are an expert and you predicted it correctly. Student recruitment crashed almost everywhere during COVID. But in Central and Eastern Europe, a lot of colleges and, and uh, advanced high schools who went back to an older style of curriculum that emphasized culture of origin appreciation, picked up a lot of students. The same thing happened in the United States and to some degree in Canada, in, in all of the states where parents were allowed to start taking their tax money and spending it and the kind of schools that they chose, when great books type programs or, or arts centric programs suddenly attracted a ton of new people voting with their feet in their pocketbooks, and they could afford to do it only because they could use their tax money. We're not talking about rich people. Most of these exploding new kinds of schools are full of, they have some white students, but the biggest components moving into them are Asian and Hispanic with a significant African-American component following it. That's interesting and it infuriates people in the traditional educational world that I spend a lot of time with, who absolutely knew where all of this was going 10 years ago, because it doesn't fit it. There are classical shared culture forms to a lot of these curricula. A lot of the European ones are going back to updated versions of curriculum that allowed you to find your own culture exceptional while you welcome the others. But they were written in Europe in the 1950s and the 19, early 60s when that was the hip cutting edge. And a lot of these schools are producing because state universities don't like this, their own college aptitude and entrance tests, which an increasing number of both European countries and in the United States, individual states are beginning to accept. This is extremely controversial. Are there reasons to be concerned about this? There are a bunch of legitimate reasons to be concerned, but it's happening and it produces a very different parent to student to graduating student vibe than what all of us have been doing. And I'm just wondering if there are some modest proposals to make from this, this culture appreciation globalism versus culture deconstruction globalism. Because I'm not arguing about the need of globalism and neither are those curricula. So the first question is, would we be in a stronger position if the recording were in progress? That would probably be true. Thank you, thank you, Custis, that was very fast. If we remembered, flip back to my quote, why we first loved and tore into our arts humanities subject. That favorite author, artist, philosopher, anthropologist, musician that we loved and wanted to dig into and then just wanted to share with other people who would catch the same fire. Because bless us, we've moved beyond that by and large, or, or we're in, in a corner somewhere trying to talk very carefully so we don't lose our job. Would we be in a stronger position if we developed a different, maybe old definition of critical thinking? It used to mean using criticism to figure out why people liked things, not an elitist way why you like something, but no one else really has the right to, or only three of your graduate students. If we developed a version of critical thinking that'll
and deconstructing the cultures the students come from. Would we be in a stronger position if we thought our teaching fields were crafts with lit microphones? Actually, this fits. A craft, after all, as opposed to a science, an art, or a holy mystery, is a product that has to not just be beautiful or imaginative, but it has to be something the working learner can use, the client can live with, the client and their family can use well and continue to be around, can understand on their terms as well as ours, not only on ours. We have to be able to talk to them. I'm, as I said, only asking, but the arts and humanities, one of their roots, I think legitimately here in the cultural school mix of ancient Athens, have been a way we've built up wisdom, beauty, shared sense, disrupted political repression of thought and speech adjudicated ways for people to get along for a very long time, faced as we have been recently with loss of freedoms, managerial or less responsive government, badly politicized science, vandalized heritages, would we be better off humble and adaptive enough to use these little serendipities that give us new ways to be culturally relevant or useful? I'm gonna sit over here and, and call in the order that all of you are on the setup. So there's that, you can pull that away. Are all of us here? Costas, or is one missing? Are all of us here or is one missing? Okay. So Professor Oberhelm, and I think you have uh, uh, some slides. Anyone who goes over eight minutes has to produce a craft product. There, I'll, I'll make that'll be how we'll actually make this work. Awesome. You have to play a piece of music, you have to pull the chair. You, have to... you, you heard, I know I'm your wife, but you do all this craft project. Like, I'm sure. <laughs> Finally over. Okay, well, thank you. I'll make this somewhat free. No, do, um, do what you do. Uh, so anyway, um, this is taken somewhat from my presentation that I give to prospective students, current students, as well as parents, etc. cetera. Um, and that is why do we study the arts and the humanities when at the same time as this going on, um, we have about 3,000 new engineers and chemists who are being given an orientation at the same time. So what I tell people is that don't listen to what um, the media tell you. Talk to the employers. They are the ones who are hiring people. And uh, in the most recent surveys, and these surveys do not change year after year, nearly 93% of employers state that the sort of skill sets that they want their new employees to have, you know, are more important than a specialized knowledge. And these are the kind of skill sets that arts and humanities, liberal arts type students have. Four attributes stand out to employers, what they're looking for when they are trying to fill many jobs. Now I'm not talking about airline pilot here. I don't want a philosopher flying my plane uh, fresh out of graduate school, all right? <laughs> I want them to have that specialized training. But I'm talking about mid-level manager, for example, for a business. They want their employees to have the ability to write well. My goodness gracious, what is the point of developing a product if you can't describe it to the um, users? Or what is the point of having a, re having a successful business for clients if you can't communicate to your clients why, um, what sort of ventures you're doing and what are your plans? 
You need to also be able to adapt to every single situation. You write differently, as you all do, to journals than you do to, um, say, to your friends, etc. There's always a different level for every single audience. Critical thinking. Uh, I mean, goodness gracious, that is the number one skill, uh, certainly. Problem solving. Analytical skills and particular in collaboration because it's no longer the cubicles, it is teamwork that gets the job done. And they also mentioned the fact that you have to be able to speak well. Um, you know, just as written communication is more than, you know, how many uh, characters is it? 60 or 80, what? I don't know, I, I you know, on Twitter or whatever. Um, also to be able to communicate well. You don't want to meet a new client and start saying, well, you know, like for sure, this is really like really good. Uh, you need to be able to speak well. And also ethics. Uh, more and more that is critical, as well as empathy. You need to be able to understand people of other cultures, to be able to um, show understanding and work well with people of other cultures. I mean, my father, who was general... Uh, Vice President General Electric, when he went in, 99% were white males. And when he left, it was a whole different workforce. And you need to be able to do that. Uh, uh, and these are the kind of skills which, by the way, never go obsolete. Uh, I remember when I was here studying in Athens, I would walk down to the uh, Vivli Athiki uh, Ethniki uh, National Library and study uh, the manuscripts right in the room after having passed four DNA tests and things like that and signed my life away that I won't steal the manuscript or stain it. Now they're digitalized, but I still have to think about it. I still have to work through the problem. I still need to write well. I need to do all these things that the skill sets give me. Uh, so even though technology is always, is always changing, basic skills are not the ability to think well, speak well, write well, analyze well. And uh, those are also transferable. That's why arts and humanities um, students, once they get a job, can move to another job. They can take a different kind of job and do it well because they are able to transfer those basic skill sets into a new position. Um, you can always learn, particularly if you've been brought up in arts and humanities major, you've taken on that learning for a lifetime thinking. And you can learn a new job skill, but you're still using these skill sets. So it's transferable. Um, and when you take a look at where students go on graduation, even though they are graduating in English, they're graduating in history, they're graduating in performance studies, they're going into business first and foremost. 21%. Um, Goldman Sachs, the great um, business firm, would only come and interview English majors. They would not even interview in the business school because they were interested in someone who could take reports, data. This is why data uh, analysis needs to be learned by arts and humanities students, by the way. They need to take math and they need to take statistics. Um, but um, to take that, make it for, you know, understandable for other managers, for bosses, for coworkers, but also for clients. Uh, and then of course they go in the legal profession, they go in the creative uh, sector. Communication is now uh, a really big thing. Now it is true, get an arts and humanities degree, you can uh, have unemployment, but guess what? Uh, right now, it's 
in the United States. Um, I said unemployment. I did not say I'm working in the degree that I got <laughs> because you are getting a degree for a job. You're not getting a degree for, I'm going to be a philosopher for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. um, but engineering has a 3% unemployment. I think that's a little margin of error that uh, one can live with. And when it comes to money, STEM graduates, they start high and they stagnate. Arts and humanities majors start decently. You know, the average is about $55,000 a year, but they keep going higher. The gap closes considerably during the lifetime of an arts and humanities major. Uh, and definitely it's better than no college degree. It's $20,000 more per year for an arts and humanities degree versus just a high school degree. Um, but once you start going on, and particularly many of our arts and humanities people get um, an advanced degree, a master's degree, that boosts you up by almost $20,000 a year as well. Um, and anyway, things change. Many of the STEM jobs out there will be gone in 10 years. Uh, a Harvard econo uh, economist took a look at um, jobs in um, computer science and said that 10 years ago, many of the job ads don't even exist anymore. Technology has moved on. And in fact, a friend of mine who was um, who is still the Dean of Engineering told me, you know, we're actually training our computer scientists now and many of their skills will be gone and no longer needed by the time they graduate. Um, so, um, technology changes a lot when I was here. I know I'm running long. That's okay. Um, but, um, when I was here, I used an IBM Selectric typewriter to type my dissertation. I had to keep changing that ball out. I would stick in uh, a ball for Hebrew for the, typing up the Hebrew manuscripts. And I would use the Greek ball um, you know, all of that had to be done, changing, changing, changing. And of course, whatever I typed stayed on the paper and that was it. There was no memory of it except in my brain. Um, yeah, but now I go down to the American School of Classical Studies in Athens and everybody has their laptop and uh, it's wonderful. But I'm still using the same um, skills as I did before. So um, anyway, I just want to point out a few slides and then I'm done. You notice that graduates in arts and humanities, they are happy with the opportunities for advancement, just as much as people in the medical field, just as much as people in engineering and in business. They're maybe not as happy as their salary because with student loans these days and trying to find housing, uh, et cetera, you know, that's going down. But the benefits are good, job security, job location. And here is the thing that, you know, people need to realize, you know, 60% of all Fortune 500 CEOs have a degree in arts and humanities. Take a look at these people. Look at their degrees. You know, founder of PayPal has a philosophy degree. Um, the CEO of American Express has a history degree. Uh, you have the, um, well, the former secretary of the treasury has no training in accounting or in finance. Instead, the person has an English degree but knows how to look at data and understand data and to analyze data. I'm a classicist, Ted Turner, who founded 
you know, CNN, TBS, TNT. He studied Greek and Latin. And look what he did. What it takes are job skills. George Soros, who wants to rule the world, in fact, he probably does, uh, and he may have me assassinated on the way home, uh, but philosophy. And the list goes on down. You can just see English, English, history, classics, again, for the former governor of California. So sometimes you get bad classicists and good classicists. Um, and um, there's a latest one. The founder of PayPal is a philosophy major. I mean, the founder of uh, Wikipedia. And uh, so the jobs are there and it's unlimited. So throw out the stereotype of you're getting a degree in performance studies. I guess you'll like to cook hamburgers. Or you're only going to be a history major. What are you going to do? Teach? No. You're a BCEO. If you work hard and use the skill sets that you have. So, um, you know, when... Uh, and this is my uh, final point. Um, I used to hand out forms to all my graduating um, seniors. And each year, we, you know, Texas A&M is large. We have 76,000 students. And uh, in uh, arts and humanities, we would graduate each year, um, oh, about uh, 2,000 or so. And of the students, we had 92% with a job or entering into postgraduate work. The other 8%, I could probably tell you who most of those are. Those are ones who were not applying themselves, did not care, um, or were counting on other means. But yes, uh, the jobs are there. And it's just a matter of using the great skill sets that it gives. So. One of the reasons I love being followed by Professor Oberhelman is he's, first of all, he's always more optimistic than I am. And I, I, I love the thought that I'm wrong. Um, but there's a common denominator there as uh, Dr. Ferguson heads to the, to the podium. And that's the ability to translate, to be able to communicate what you're good at into things. I think uh, uh, one of Dr. Oberhelman's best points was the shareability of the human humanities and arts and their ability to go across data boundaries uh, with good thinking. Professor Ferguson. Loading. So I uh, appreciate Steve's comments and I, I serve in a similar role. Uh, so I, I've, I've done the, the same pitch to, to incoming students or prospective students at, at my university. I, I'll just add that the founder of YouTube you had down there as a fine art student, he graduated from our institution. He's uh, he, he he pursued graphic design. So, so it's a little bit more applied than <laughs> perhaps some others. But anyway, uh, the Americans will understand this, this little title here. Just to get something out of the way, so Indiana University of Pennsylvania, we covered this a little bit earlier, but uh, the state is Pennsylvania, right? And that's where we're here. The county is Indiana and the town is Indiana. And so it was named for the town. And there are 14 schools within the state system within uh, the state of Pennsylvania. And each school is named for the town that they're in. So included within the state system is California University of Pennsylvania because it's in the town of California, Pennsylvania. So it's not just us. Uh, it started off as a, a normal school and, and kind of grew up from there. So um, we we moved from being a, comp a teacher training school to being a comprehensive university. So we had, at the beginning of our founding, kind of a job creation. We were about job training, really, if we get right down to it. Um, what emerged as it became Indiana University of Pennsylvania is a greater uh, inclusion of the uh, the liberal arts. So, uh, in fact, even today we have a very robust uh, liberal arts education with uh, 
multiple English classes required. Everybody has to have a math. Everybody has to have history class and and uh, two sciences, and so on and so forth. Um, we also had strong traditions in music, English, and history. Um, we still serve first generation college students uh, as as a part of our mission and um, as a, a point of pride, but also as a challenge. Uh, because frequently those first generation college students, the parents at this point in time, if if you don't haven't already had a degree, you're really, really behind in terms of understanding the inner workings of um, higher education in general and um, are coming from a greater degree of disadvantage economically. Um, to this, um, this is something I, I want to point out. Uh, I started at IUP in 2001, and at that time, as a system supported by the state, 67% of the state of the school's budget came from the state, and it's now only 17%. All right, so what that means is that we've increasingly become uh, dependent upon tuition to pay the bills. So for a while, we were able to continue to admit people. We had people. Our particular region um, has greatly decreased. You know, there, there aren't coal miners anymore. Um, there, there are, but there's two of them working in a strip mine way far away. So this, this actually was taken from my university president's recent address. And he showed that, okay, so we've got this little blue line where we, we're going to have an increase, and this is based upon live births within our region. Um, we're, we're looking at a, a further decline that we already have experienced. So now we're a little bit over 9,000 students. We're down from a high of 15,000 at one point in time. So this kind of constriction, and COVID certainly uh, played a role in, in that for all of us. Pressure from the state system. Uh, we went through a round of uh, furloughs, retrenchment, um, and it, it was across the board. It wasn't limited to the arts and humanities, but um, and it wasn't just faculty. Uh, administration and staff positions were also lost. At the same time, we have to increase class sizes. So where we once prided ourselves in having no more than 30 in a class, now we're looking at um, upwards of 100. This was, this was something that distinguished us from a place like Penn State. Penn State, you're going to go there, it's going to be, you're going to be just a number. We can't say that anymore. It's, it, so that's part of the challenge. So now we have a new college structure. I previously was in the College of Fine Arts uh, that was art, music, theater, dance, performance. And now I am uh, in the College of Arts and Humanities, which has those three plus, um, and it's probably a more common format. So English, foreign languages, uh, philosophy, religious studies, uh, political science, history. Yeah, I think that's it, right? Next year, it's gonna be those plus com media, and criminology. And they're putting together history, philosophy, religious studies, and political science into one department. Not because they really have that much to do with each other, but because. So these are some of the uh, challenges that we've had. It, it's hard for us to look at this and not feel like we're losing. Um, and then we, we still fight the good fight. And so my, my title is about persisting, right? Um, so at the same time that everything is being closed and, and constricted, suddenly we're getting a new school for osteopathic medicine. This doesn't make me feel better. <laughs> now, I we obviously need healthcare professionals and they can't be philosophers strictly. They could have gone to undergrad for philosophy and then gone to med school, and they'll probably get a lot of that. Um, I hope that there's some ethics training, at least, involved with the osteopathic folks. 
we, this is true. We have an aging population. Um, there's a need for growth to cover the uh, the needs of particularly rural areas. Um, but it, we see the pendulum going back to not just being a comprehensive university, but more we're about job training. And it has to be a specific job. Uh, so that's what's difficult for us. Now, the ways that we have persisted and that we will continue to persist is uh, we have a particular uh, faculty member who was successful in getting a grant from the Teagle Foundation and the National Endowment for the Humanities. And uh, it's called the Big Idea, the Big Ideas Series. And they packaged it together in a, a certificate and it's several different classes. Uh, some of them check boxes for the liberal studies curriculum, and some of them are standalone just because you're interested. Uh, they all look at the great ideas from literature over time, over the history. Uh, it's it's probably the closest thing that we would have to something that would be a truly classics-centered literature. It wouldn't include Greek or Latin, but uh, in terms of the the critical thinking content and uh, historical content, it definitely has that. Uh, the grant helps to keep the class sizes down so and for embedded tutors. So it really helps those first generation college students to succeed within that that setting. Uh, other ways that we have tried to work within a system that we've already seen changing, uh, our Department of Theater uh, embraced applied theater. So um, applied theater is when you're using uh, theater techniques for a non-theatrical purpose. So in this case, we have students who are trained to take on the role of a patient. And we before we had an osteopathic school, we were working with the School of Nursing. So the nurses were getting training not with a, a dummy, but with a student. We'll assume that the students are not dummies. Um, so that's that's one of the ways that, that we've kind of persisted and, and also showing to uh, parents, this is a viable job alternative, a, a viable job path for students who are in theater. Um, so we anticipate that that student standardized uh, patient work will continue uh, with the School of Osteopathic Medicine. Uh, we've also just recently put together an AI certificate that is a collaboration with the Departments of English, Philosophy, and History. Um, and it's marketed to computer science uh, majors to give them the, the kinds of critical thinking, moral engagement uh, about what, what, what what's really going on with uh, artificial intelligence and try and get out ahead of this uh, because we, we can already imagine so some of the good things about using AI to make things easier, but maybe how there may be some, uh, some pitfalls perhaps. So these are some of the ways that, that we're working through this. So look forward to hearing what you have to say later. Okay. Thank you. And I'm glad to hear the, the pitch for ethics and Professor Fergus yes. uh, makes it. We are, there, there could be a dozen different views of it, but we are in the fourth year in the United States of the American Medical Association having to vote on a persistent proposal that the Hippocratic Oath be discarded as obsolete and, uh, and human beings be properly viewed as engineerable material. Mm. And, you know, that I, I doubt that some of the European medical communities are in all that different positions, especially after what we saw in COVID. So I hope that, that continues to be true. Uh, Professor Schmidt, I think you're next. Okay. Can we call on you? So, which one? Uh, uh, yeah. The PDF. The PDF for now. Yeah. 
you're interested in the big idea that I didn't have some words. Oh, right. yeah, yeah. Like that. Oh. Yeah. 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 Next, I'm back. And uh, data pointers? The, the pointer point. is the middle. Oh, the middle. Yeah. Stay yeah. close to the microphone. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, I will do two presentations today. The uh, top one spin off is this one, and it's actually a spin off of this one. So ideally, it would have been the other way around. So I have to give you two slides of context for this one but it will actually uh, detail it more when we when we uh, when you listen to the next presentation up one down one nah. aim it at the laptop there we go ah uh, too much what okay so um, when you look at the sustainable development goals, and we already heard about um, the skills somebody will have, but actually uh, sustainable development goals, they actually on the top, they call it inner development goals, is actually connectedness. What is connectedness? And in this chart you see, oh, escape. No? Well, that button can. Ah, I'm back. On this one, you see connectedness, social connectedness about people and knowledge connectedness, everything you know. Uh, at the moment, we all store it in documents. So uh, one of the things I wrote about this for the last 10 years, uh, many papers, 35 are Scopus Index. And since last year, I'm actually doing a startup in Mauritius to actually create a digital platform to do what I wrote about. So I try to connect the social connectedness with the knowledge connectedness. Anybody, everybody tries to do this and uh, you will see later a chart with, uh, with some examples. Um, but um, we have from the World Bank a report in 2017 that they say digital Digital technology is thriving, but digital dividends are not. Because of this lack of connectedness, everybody wants to go in the top corner where you fuse the knowledge connectedness with the social connectedness. How do I try to do it? First, you need a digital platform. You need what I call a mimetic repository. That's different from a document repository. And I come to that in the next slide. And then you assemble a community, a very diverse community, as you will see later today, to actually bring it because the people will share the memetics and the memes with, with the other ones. Um, we will talk about um, in the second presentation how this can be verified because there are certain standards uh, you can use. What is memetics? What does this have to do with humanities and arts, you might ask. Uh, firstly, of course, is educational technology, and we all evolve with education and learning and uh, teaching. But secondly, memetics is an old idea. Richard Dawkins wrote a book about the selfish gene in 1976. And you know probably internet memes. This is actually left over from his big idea of uh, memes. And around the millennium, you had a lot of uh, books about memetics. And you even had a journal for memetics. Memes are thought as a metaphor for knowledge as a living organism. Think all your ideas ever created are uh, swirling around in the world. And they're trying to find the brain. Because for survival, they have to be remembered. And when they find the brain, a host, a human, they try to change his or her behavior because to survive, 
these humans have to talk about this meme with others. They have to make a combination with, with this meme with other memes. Or the best thing is they write it down because then the meme may survive for millennia. So think about any document you see as a creation as memes. You don't have documents any, anymore. Any document you can break down in memes, in ideas, in the sequential sequence of memes. And all these memes are connected. And you not only publish in the repository this document, you can actually share, if you want, voluntarily, all the scaffolding around it. And you can share all the connections, not within the document, but with all the other documents. And other people who do read it and share, they actually add more connections to other things which were not in the original document. So you create a knowledge graph. And because of this, you can curate the repository where this is in. Everybody who is a member of the community can use a shared classification system. So you don't have only outliners, which you can only use or card indexes, which you can only use personally, but you can share it with everybody. So for the moment, just take a leap of faith and believe me that you can actually create a repository of knowledge heritage with memes instead of documents and that you can curate it. Now we're getting to the spin-off. What can you do with something like this? Obviously you can share and some people can use it like Lego blocks and build new documents, new knowledge and you reuse what's already there and better than Lego blocks, you can create a new version of an old meme and change it. And then you have a genealogical um, path from the new to the old or from the old to the new. And then you create knowledge asset. And knowledge asset is defined as a, as a bet on the future utility of something and the benefit. That's fine. But you can do something else. You can create learning assets. All my publications are in a meme-based repository. And what I have written about, I can create a knowledge management course with it. How would that look like? What is the benefit of it? You could create not um, linear um, e-learning course, because we live in a non-linear world, you can create a sphere. And learning asset would be just one learning unit in the middle. And you create a certain structure and any learner could come and could start wherever they want. And when they have finished this learning uh, unit, they can now decide if they go north, west, south, or east. And you can make this sphere as big as possible. So you not only have different courses for different levels on the national qualification framework, everything is in there. And you can, if you don't know the background, you get a level deeper, but you harvest and pick the national qualification framework points as you, as you need or as guided. The author could build, close certain doors you're not allowed to take. And when you enough, have enough credits, you can go and get a certification. For the author, if you have one learning unit, let's say this is a my knowledge management course, you can use this unit and put it in another one, like project management. Now, if you've done this, you might ask yourself as a learner, hey, I just learned this. How can I use this in other contexts? And then you not only have a path within this sphere, but you could go to other spheres. So, it can be re reused and recycled and every learning unit has to only exist once. Like any meme has to be uh, only once. The other thing is, if you successfully completed the learning unit, because remember, it's built of memes, you actually can use the memes and send it to the students on this personal device. You can even send it to your alumni students because you always, as a university educational institution, want to create links and relationships with the alumni. You can give them a 
lifelong connection to the university because they will constantly be updated on those things. So it's a new concept, a new vision. Can I tell you more about it? Yes. Will I? No, because I'm finding a patent for this. And that means it can't, can't be prior art when I disclose it to anybody. But believe me, take a leap of faith, something like this is possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Schmidt. It's nice to hear a reminder of there are, are, are more categories of students than the one coming from high school. Can I add something I forgot? Uh, can you do it quickly? Yeah. I said it's uh, from the humanity point of view and philosophical point, it links to memetics. But the whole memetic idea is very close to Popper's three world. Popper's third world is abstract, is uh, inaccessible, is intangible. What I do I actually change this around to make it accessible, tangible, and uh, um, uh, so everybody can use and share it. Another link to humanity. I forgot to mention. Universities are often very limiting in which clientele they go after. While I, I check and see if Professor Kenyaka is ready to come up. Um, continue, ongoing education, which is uh, the college is selling to people who come back after three years in the job market, try and see if they can take two more classes and make a little more money. Uh, most colleges are selling to those, but they're but the largest money demand for universities and colleges right now are from close to retirement to retirement age people who want to come back during the daytime, not at night, like the business people, and take classes that they now want for personal enrichment. And they have the money to spend, and they're taking them in the same hours you're teaching your other students. And guess what? 85% of those are in the arts and humanities. Mm -hmm. Alexandra Trenyaka is... Uh, a uh, professor in literature at the Marie Curie Slodowska University. It might be even close with that. Yes. Yeah. She's sure. smiling when she, like she does when she's mm -hmm. being kind in Poland mm -hmm. uh, to talk about uh, teaching or sharing literature. Classroom is a literary club. Thank you so much. And I'm honored to participate in this roundtable discussion. And I would like to share with you my experience with uh, teaching literature especially 17th and 18th century literature in my classroom. So it will be my practical experience with my students. And uh, okay. to start with, I just want to start from a definition of literature and uh, literature awareness by Susan Floch. And she states that in order to be literary aware, we need of course, awareness, differentiation, and interest. So we know how to, uh, we are aware of the pieces of literature we are discussing. We know how to distinguish between certain texts and the value between different genres. And we are interested in literature overall, but how to achieve it in a classroom uh, at the university? Because these are just theoretical statements and the practical issue is different. So let's see uh, how we can do it. And I will share with you my experience. Uh, so um, my working life environment is also a uh, university. I'm, I'm a literature professor and I'm a writer and I look at my students and literary classes from this uh, point of view. So uh, I started asking myself when I began my classes, uh, what does the concept of university classroom mean? Actually, it's much different from, I don't know, high school classroom or primary school classroom. Is it a classroom at all or is it something different? Is it? And also, who are our students? They are adults. And I thought to approach it differently. We are meeting in the so-called university classroom, but we are meeting with adults. It's it's like an environment for a discussion, and we need to engage our students uh, in in an exchange. So I decided to uh, treat literature just as I feel as a pleasure and as a value, and I hope to encourage my students to feel the same. And it, I decided to come every day to my classroom, not to teach them, but to share and learn with them because I'm I I'm constantly learning, and we all do. And I decided to convert classroom into a literary club. And I told my students we will have a literary club. And uh, in, in this sense, I hope to achieve awareness, differentiation, and interest. And um, I, will, I would like to share with you a couple of examples. But to start with, 
Um, okay, to start with, it's obvious, obvious one. Okay. Okay, now it will be fine. I'm sorry. So instead of, first of all, uh, I decided to allow my students to approach literature very differently. So instead of uh, concentrating on the exam questions and exam perspectives or asking questions, the questions that I remember from high school, which I didn't like too much, what did the author want to tell you? Uh, instead of this, we are asking questions like, how did the author possibly feel? How is the narrator feeling? How is the text making you feel in this day and age? Because it's different. And each text becomes a different text when it's read by a different reader. Uh, how would you feel in this situation? How are the characters feeling? What do you think about them personally? And what do you think about the text on the whole? Uh, why did you enjoy the text? Why did you dislike it? Because some students do not enjoy these texts and it's and it's, when we engage in a discussion sometimes it happens that they develop a new connection a new sense of connection with a given text because every reader uh, decodes the message differently and the same book becomes a different text when approached by a new a new reader so the basis for our classes are like literature is a living entity uh, wh while authors are actual living people they were actual people and this is to me, this was the key important uh, uh, part of our meetings, because oftentimes the authors of the works we analyzed, the works from 17th and 18th century, were my students' age. And they, they were acting in a very similar way to my students, even though it was ages ago, and they were struggling with very similar problems. And I think that we need to engage with empathetic reading, so finding to trying to find connections between students, between author students versus students and literary characters and their situations, because I believe that literature, it's all about finding connections and it's all about empathy. It's all about mutual understanding. So how we did it, I would like to share with you a couple of very quick practical examples. So for example, we analyze, uh, we discuss metaphysical poetry, and one of the metaphysical poets is George Herbert. And here he is. Uh, he has this wonderful collection, The Temple, published after his death in 1633. Uh, and one of the poems is The Caller. And actually, George Herbert is such an interesting, fascinating person. And uh, that's why he deserves a, an introduction that would really bring him closer to the students. Because if we, I believe, so how do I analyze uh, George Herbert's poetry with my students? So first of all, uh, I would like to do something different from the first example. Today we will discuss the works of George Herbert. Sometimes in high school I heard who was a great poet. This is immediately the reaction would be... Uh, contrary to our expectations. And I would like to always find a connection between here and now and the past. So I would like to say something like, today I would like to invite you to meet George Herbert. We are meeting him. He was your age because he was when he wrote the poem, The Color, in which he describes a struggle which, is, which you might find relatable because the struggle was about his future occupation. He had a different dream. His family had, a, his mother had a different dream. Uh, the, the, the financial economic reality was specific. So very similar situation, even though it was 17th century. So he's like a, a colleague, a friend of students struggling with the same. And I think this is very important to acknowledge. And then students really remember George Herbert because they treat him as a friend and they know he struggled really badly, which is so beautifully and painfully presented in his poem. And also we can... Uh, use empathetic reading when talking about literary characters and those of my fellow teachers who specialize in 17th and 18th century uh, fiction will of course know that John Milton's Satan in Paradise Lost is such a fascinating figure as a literary character and uh, of course it's very important uh, during literary classes to acknowledge and recognize that Milton's Satan is a literary construct, a character and does not represent like a religious entity during our classes because we are critics, we are not like a religious circle uh, but it's also very important to possess an ability to fully empathize with the character and Milton's Satan is very human-like and he has so many ambiguous, ambivalent sides uh, that students really 
really uh, feel as well. And they find this character so memorable and so close sometimes because he's very human-like to them that he stays in the memory throughout the whole course. So I don't want to discuss him as one of John Milton's distant creations, but we try to also look at Milton's Satan empathetically and psychologically as well. And finally, let me see. It's also important to recognize historical context. And here I have two examples, Robinson Crusoe and Jane Eyre. So first of all, there is this multidimensional perspective. We need to understand that a given text uh, had a different understanding and different meaning on the background of the past. And it has a different uh, meaning in the 21st century. When we analyze, let's say, the students need to be aware that in the past, uh, Robinson Crusoe was seen differently from what we see in this text nowadays. We, nowadays, we are more sensitive to issues such as slavery, such as uh, equality. In the past, the readers would, wouldn't would be concerned with Robinson trading slaves. And, and, and students are, need to acknowledge that. And we also need to find out what students see in, in these texts. The same with Jane Eyre. In the past, uh, the readers wouldn't wonder why there is this prisoner in the attic. Nowadays, we wonder about it. Also, students find different historical contexts uh, surprising. It's important to make them sensitive to the historical context, and it's important to find out what they know, what they think about the historical past, so that we create this common ground for understanding and discussion. And okay, so this is this is my uh, approach to uh, studying and teaching literature, and I believe it's always searching for connections on several levels and noticing these connections with with empathy, with respect, with understanding. And what I mean by respect and understanding is, hey, thank you, uh, to acknowledge that we are guests in the past, in the literary past, uh, we are guests. And we are not coming, of course, we are there to look critically at it, but at the same time, without this past, we wouldn't be able to establish any new connections now, so we need to respect it. And it's a magical journey of one's heart. So I believe that everyone can study for an exam, but the main idea should be to feel the value of literature and because it's pleasure, it's not a homework assignment, in fact, and I also feel that it's everything that we have ever been lived through and witnessed. It's all in, in literature. And actually, on different levels. So this is this is my short presentation. I would like to thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Well, I, I call Mr. Carswell. I just want to note without sounding too much like uh, it's another episode about the Greeks and the ghosts, but somewhere in his grave, C.S. Lewis is probably smiling. He, he wrote a, one of his least known brilliant books, The Crimson, and it sounds like he and Alexander are on the same page. He was worried that we were becoming self destructive and maybe criticized things. And what we needed was critical thinking that looked at how people actually read books, the readers, um, how people listened to music as opposed to the experts talking about it, how people experienced paintings. And not us, but all of them, how they experience it. This sounds very much like what, what you're preaching. Uh, Mr. Cardwell, uh, we, who you already heard of, is wants to um, add a few words in this case on cultivating internationalist composers. Yeah, well, I thought I'd talk specifically about composers and figured you can probably take away from it what you will. But I think, first of all, I have to start with the caution. There are two main traps you can fall into with the internationalists composing, the first of which is cultural appropriation. But actually, the second is where the composer's cultural style is blindly imposed onto music from another culture at the expense of musicality. Now, I love Beethoven, but he's actually a good example of this. He took the song Old Lang Syne by Scottish poet Rabbi Burns, a song still famously sung at New Year's, and he rearranged or rewrote it as part of a collection of pieces inspired by traditional folk songs. Now, the original song belongs in a pub. Even now, just a few days ago, it was sung in pubs across the UK for Hogmanay, its lyrics heavy with beer and whiskey. 
But Beethoven imposed upon it a style more at home in the concert halls of Vienna. And in doing so, the heart of Auld Lang Syne was removed and the piece was reduced to nothing more than a mere curiosity for Viennese audiences. And it leaves Beethoven's piece mediocre and lacklustre because it's trapped in the hollowed out shell of the original song. It's almost similar to how a, ti a caged tiger is never as majestic as it was in the wild. So what does it take for a composer to be successful in being internationalist? Well, fundamentally, the approach comes down to the compositional voice. Now, each composer, similar to an author, has their own unique style or feel. It's why we can say a piece sounds like Mozart or like Debussy or like Beethoven. And this innate voice is unconsciously born of a person's nature, their experience of the world, and most fundamentally, their engagement with musical influences. And ultimately, teaching composition is about enabling students to find and develop their compositional voice, which is a journey that never ends. And with that in mind, being an internationalist composer requires a curious, genuine, almost naive approach to another culture's music in which the compositional voice is impacted by the foreign music as opposed to the compositional voice being imposed upon the other culture. And interestingly, Scotland's unique place in the world lends itself to cultivating this approach. Whilst the UK leans towards isolationism, Scotland has always been internationally focused or historically with the Enlightenment or Renaissance series and the King James IV, or more recently because its declining population necessitates immigration. And there was an overwhelming majority voting to remain in the EU in 2016. And when you combine this with, because Scotland has a higher education funding model, which can be problematic, but it, it means that universities rely heavily on international students. Now combine all of this, with Scotland's naturally self-deprecating view of itself and the ingrained exposure to internationalism reads in students a mindset of compositional respect and curiosity as opposed to imposing one's culture onto the music of another as Beethoven did with Robbie Burns. Now that's not to say that internationally minded composers can only come from countries of a specific political um, sort of leaning, far from it. There is no clear cut method, answer, nor solution to cultivating internationalist composers. Indeed, the enigmatic nature of composition demands its teaching be an art in and of itself. But an international approach fundamentally comes down to building in students a firm musical and compositional foundation, whilst fostering an environment in which they use this foundation as a launch pad to experiment musically. And this means exposing them to new music, especially from different cultures, and encourage them to explore them in depth and push themselves beyond their musical boundaries, whether instrumentally, tonally, notationally. And in Aberdeen, we found with our postgraduates that an effective way of doing this is short composer residencies, where a well-known composer comes for a week and as part of this, our postgrad composition students have one-to-one -one tutorials with them, allowing for an external input from a respected voice. And although the composers themselves were often British, they were good at directing the students in a whole new area of music based on their own experiences, whether that be um, Eastern Orthodox harmonies or American sacred, uh, contemporary sacred music. But there also needs to be a collaboration with instrumentalists and composers of different cultures, because the inherent link between society, culture, and music means a wholly authentic understanding of another culture's music cannot be found solely in books and lectures. And it's also important to allow students to get their hands on the instruments and experiment with the sounds. And linked into this, it's also important to allow students to hear the products of their compositional e experimentation. Elsewise, it gets it risks getting trapped in the, the academic abstract. And this can be done with live singers or instrumentalists, or if that's not possible, with 
high quality VST virtual instruments uh, like um, the native or Spitfire libraries. But there are also significant hurdles to cultivating internationalist composers. Our musical notation system is Western, as is the framework of our classical music. And this fact cannot be escaped. And it makes engagement with non-Western music more difficult, although not impossible. And since it's the Western rule, since it's the rules of Western music that which form the students' musical foundation, it's vital that students are explicitly exposed to when Western composers broke Western rules. And there are plenty throughout history. Monteverde, the grandfather of Western music, ripped apart every rule with his Vespers, Mozart with his German language operas, Beethoven with his third symphony, and again with his ninth, or the serial movement, which turned the very notion of, um, of tonality and notation on its head. And this is just scratching the surface. Now, the importance of cultivating internationalist composers should not be underestimated. In fact, if you take one thing away from what I've said today, it's this. None of what I've said is for the sake of being global or internationalist. Everything I've said is for the sake of cultivating better composers. And yes, internationalism is a nice, is a welcome side effect. Do we wrap up to this? But a compositional voice needs the depth and richness of other cultures as it languishes in mediocrity. And I'll use myself as an example. My own compositional voice has influences from, amongst others, ancient Greek linguistic sounds, Latin chants, Eastern instrumentation, serialism, Scottish Highland droids, French atonality, English worship music, American minimalism, Eastern Orthodox harmonies. And this breadth of influence is the same for every composer worth their due. And so as I draw to an end, at the heart of cultivating internationalist composers is the need to build in students a solid musical foundation, alongside the need to foster an environment in which, in which they can experiment musically with other cultures, allowing their compositional voice to be influenced and impacted, making it deeper and richer. Because this is not internationalism for internationalism's sake, this is internationalism for the sake of our composer's musicality. That's me. <laughs> we have just a couple of minutes and, and uh, be strong. You are um, headed for lunch at last. Abner is the land of the late lunch to put three mottos together. <laughs> yeah, so after lunch, we have one more session. But I didn't want to stop, not so much for questions this time as for comments. And it says, and anyone want to to react with an idea or just a suggestion to something that someone has has said here? I've thrown some of mine out already. I my job is to intersperse between the others, but yes. I'll I'll note that there's kind of a theme like like from the very beginning when David was talking about Athens being the place that invented itself as a destination and bringing in foreigners and whatnot, um, be, because they they provided great value for Athens, right? It's the same thing with, with uh, internationalist composers. It, it makes for better composers. And and I'll just observe that the problem that, that I pointed out with respect to uh, our population decline within our given region um, could have been solved or could still yet be solved by greater immigration. And we had a leader of some note who, as we, we also at, at our institution depended upon having a certain amount of uh, foreign students to, to up, up the ranks, and we benefited from their perspective. As soon as a travel ban went in place, they have never come back. And and so the the big takeaway for me is you know that we have many examples of how opening things up is of greater benefit to all than closing things down. That's my thing. It's probably not not irrelevant that there are different ways to open things up. Yeah. Athens opened itself up to a 
a wide variety of different cultures by insisting on at the same time being the argumentative, noisy, demonstrative, in your face talking place it was itself. Because what you wanted was all of those outsiders to come and do that. Not to come and be in their own neighborhood or impose their own culture, but come here and get in the noisy conversation and be part of the hubbub. And so you have to like something about yourself to make this work, I think. You can't just decide that you are a, a dying shell and ask someone else to fill it. But I was mentioning, I think it was to you, when Gregory was doing his definition of, I can talk because he's not here. You are here, and I will, I will say it to your face. I thought it was interesting that every single person that Gregory listed in his definition of Greek, at least ancient, in his definition of Greek identity was a diaspora person. Every single one. Oh, he wasn't one of the ones you had on the screen. Um, Isocrates, I couldn't stand most of the teachers. The, 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 the people talking about the definition um, from Xenophon to Herodotus, um, even in some ways Thucydides, even though he lived in Athens most of his career, um, lived in it under house arrest as an exile inside the town. Xenophon was an exile almost his entire life. Herodotus grew up in the Persian world and traveled on a Persian passport and came here in his old age to try and explain the cultures he had visited. The, I, I mean that he understood every other part of the world better than Greece. And he got tired of it and he had to move to Italy before he went crazy. He actually couldn't hack the town. So it's a, it is, I think, an element in Greekness to need all of you here making this noise and harmonizing, finding some way to, into, you know, that's why I think jazz has always been a wonderful metaphor for things that Greeks have done well, because they, they want to hear all the different themes that you are playing and they want to try and improvise something that makes them go together.